Nothing like the house of God in Jesus' name, right? Amen. Before we get started here, I just want us to pray. We're talking about altars. We've been talking about it for the last few weeks. And um, I've got some direction of how I feel to deal with altar working tonight. But let's just one more time before we get into that. Let's go ahead and just lift our hands and just open our hearts. And just thank Him for what He's done, been doing at Antioch Central. Thank Him for what He's doing in in us personally. God, I just pray that right now by the authority of Your Word and by the power that is in Your name, Jesus. Lord, that You would give us wisdom, that You give us understanding, God, that You would help sharpen these giftings and these abilities to be able to help the lost, the backslidden, to help those that are saints in the church to find You, Lord, to to know you at a deeper level, God. I pray that the spirit of revelation and the spirit of wisdom would be in this meeting tonight, God, that you would give us a sound mind, an open heart to receive from you, Jesus. God, we want to be everything that you've called us to be. We want to visit our altar and we want to help others as they come to their altar. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, just for another moment. In the name of Jesus. God, give us wisdom. Give us revelation. Give us understanding. Help us, Jesus, to stir up the gift that's inside of us that was put on us by the laying on of hands. Help us to stir up the gifts that are within us, God. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. God, help us to stir up the gifts that are within us, Jesus. Stir up the gifts, Jesus, so we can be effective ministers for your glory we can be effective for your kingdom, God, whether in the church or outside the church. Help us to be effective, God. Sharpen our senses, God. Sharpen our sensitivity, Jesus. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Pastor took the words right out of my mouth of what I was going to say when I got up here, and that is, man, we are one blessed church. We are one blessed church. It's been amazing to see all the different ministries and all the ways that God has been using people. The Sunday was very powerful. God did such a great work. And I honor both of those men of God that were used mightily Sunday morning and Sunday night. It's just, it's exciting to be a part of the body and play a role in it, isn't it? Everybody has a role in his body. And we need to submit to that and just give ourselves to it. And God does great things. Amen. Well, my family and I had a really interesting few weeks. We were hit with a stomach bug for a little while and then virus on virus. And uh, we, uh, we sold our washing machine the same day we got a stomach virus, so you fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Uh, very interesting few weeks. But God is good. God is good. Everyone's healthy now. Praise God. Praise God. But I give you guys honor, pastor, your family, and all the great leadership, men of God of this church, women of God. It's exciting. I'm going to make one quick announcement. I did post it on Realm. Um, The Awaken Our Campus, we're doing um, prayer and fasting starting next week. We'd love for you to join us if you're able to. It's open to anybody. Uh, Tuesday night at ACC at night, we're going to be there praying. Wednesday night at Maryland. Friday night at Maryland. And then Saturday morning at ACC. We are taking some transportation up to Maryland if you're interested. Meeting at the church at 6 on Wednesday and Friday. And then the following week, it's going to be very powerful. We're believing a lot of people are going to receive the Holy Ghost. We're bringing in a guest evangelist 
from Florida. Most of you probably have heard of Mark Morgan. Uh, this is his nephew, Dylan Morgan. You guys remember Jeff Morgan. He was here for about four months back in, I think, 2018. And this is his son, uh, Dylan Morgan, who's very gifted in the gift of faith. And he's going to be preaching all of our Holy Ghost rallies at both campuses. And we'd love to see, if you're able to, the support from the local church, because we can't do this without you. I believe that God is wanting to bring the generations together for there to be a multi-generational harvest and a multi-generational bonding and laboring together. The Bible, the very last verse in the Old Testament is that he's going to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. I believe that that is very prophetic of the closing of the Old Testament. I know technically, you know, I, I get the technicality of when the new covenant started, but there's a reason that's the last verse of Malachi. Because he was saying, if you're going to enter into this new covenant, we're going to enter into this new place, the generations have got to link together and be working together in the spirit. And this is an opportunity for that. So we'd love to have you, if you're able to pray with us, evangelize with us, or just help us pray people through, whatever. We'd love to have you guys. So just be praying and thinking about that over the next few weeks. Amen. Praise God. We're going to go ahead and dive into this now. Um, I'm going to talk to you about altar working, but I'm going to talk to you about it from, an, from a, an angle that I believe is going to help us that is going to be transitional to what Brother Maud is going to finish with next week. Uh, Brother Isaac hit on a lot about dying out, about we need to have our own altar, we need to submit to God, we need to learn His voice. Brother Mott talked a lot about a personal altar talked about the fire, the purpose of fire. And what I feel to talk about is I feel to talk about the transition of from your personal altar to then entering in to an altar with others. I'm going to talk about the transition side of things, of moving into that realm of working with people. And then Brother Mott, I'm going to talk a little bit about faith building, talk about unity, talk about getting people to a place where they're able to receive. And then Brother Mott next week is going to be hitting on some things regarding dominion and the very practical side of reading people in an altar, knowing what to say, how to deal with them, things of that sort. So I believe that all of this is going to flow together in Jesus' name. You can go ahead and be seated. I, uh, I'm going to say something real quick before I dive into my scripture. And that is something that, just to kind of reach back into Brother Isaac and Brother Mott's sessions, that I think is going to help you, because it's something I read recently that really spoke to me. And I believe it will speak to you. It was a man, I was reading a book about prayer, and he, he was talking about how you stay connected to God. Or, in the framework of what we're dealing with, how do you stay on the altar? How do you... Stay connected to the Lord. How do you stay on that altar and keep that fire burning? And he made this comment that really spoke to me and, I mean, changed my life in just a few weeks. He said, the way that you get God's attention is that he first has to have yours. That sounds very simple. <laughs> but let it, let, just let simmer on it for a second. The way that you get God's attention is when he finally has yours. Ministry is not God's attention. Worshiping just to worship is not necessarily you putting your mind on God because we can do things out of habit. We can minister out of habit. We can go to church out of habit. He's talking about when your mind is stayed upon him. When your mind is fixed upon him, he's got, he's now giving you his attention. I read that and I went, oh my goodness, that is so powerful. And then all of a sudden, the Lord just dropped in my spirit, Moses, with the burning bush. And I'm going, oh my goodness, there's the principle. God had the invitation with the bush being on fire. The, there was fire there. But it wasn't until Moses said, now let me turn aside and see this great sight that God started talking. You see, that's the principle. 
He's already given us an invitation. It's called the cross. It's called the word of God. It's called the logos. It's called all the things of God, the, the, the manifold wisdom of God. All of it is already on a table before us. But that doesn't make him start speaking. What makes him start speaking is when you've given him your full attention. When you give him your attention, your fixed mind, that's when God starts talking. It's deep, but it's not. It's simple, but it's revelatory. Because when I started thinking about all the stuff that's in the way, the weights, the cares, all these things, I'm going, oh my gosh. My mind's not been fixed on, yeah, I've been doing ministry, yeah, I've been doing this, yeah, I've been visiting the altar. But has my mind been truly fixed to the point where there's a constant flow? And if there's not a constant flow, then it's probably because you haven't given him your attention yet. You get God's attention when you give him yours. I'll leave that for whoever wants it, but I'm telling you to help me. That is a key to staying on the altar. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Let me hear you say one accord. They were in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound. Let me hear you say, suddenly there came a sound. And it filled all the house. It came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There's the first altar of the New Testament. The fire fell. But there was something that had to happen before the fire could fall. They were in one accord in one place. And then suddenly there came a sound from heaven. I declare to you that there will be no sound and there will be no fire if there's no one accord and no unity. There's got to be one accord and unity individually between you and your walk with God. There's got to be one accord with you and those you labor with. There's got to be unity in one accord with those you are ministering to if the fire is going to fall. If there's going to be a sound from heaven. There's the principle again. You give him your attention and he gives you his. The fire falls when the people of God come into unity. The unity of the faith. They come into the unity of being submitted one to another. The unity of the Spirit of God personally between you and Him. If there's no unity, if there's no one accord, there will be no sound and there will be no fire. Brother Mike, what does this have to do with altar working? I want to know how to pray people through the Holy Ghost. You will soon, but you've got to catch this because these are building blocks that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with building blocks because the problem is you can begin to learn how to operate in a gift and start operating in a gift without the gift giver, without the one doing it through you, and it gets very dangerous. It becomes detrimental to you and everybody you're working with. That's why we've got to keep reminding you you've got to have an altar personally. That's why I'm here to remind you you've got to be in unity of spirit between you and God, you and others, and those that you are reaching. And why Brother Mott's going to deal with, okay, this is the steps of how you pray people through. This is, this is how you get there. But we've got to be in one accord, in one mind. In the, in the Greek, that word one accord means one mind, one accord, one passion. The Greek word, I can't pronounce it, but I think it's said something along the lines of homothuma. Thumadion, I can't even say it, but it's a compound of two words meaning to rush along and in unison. The image of the word one accord is a musical image. It's, it, it almost is basically painting a picture of a number of notes that are sounded, that are sounded which while they are different, they harmonize and in pitch and in tone. 
as the instruments of a great concert under the direction of the concert master, so the Holy Spirit blends together the lives of the members of Christ's church. What, what that scripture is saying is that all these notes are different. They're distinct. They don't sound the same. If you were to, if you were to hit that note by yourself and then hit your, this note by yourself, they sound distinctly different. But when they come together in unison, there is a beautiful sound. It comes together in cohesion, and there is something that is greatly done in unity with many different sounds that are all distinctly different but they make one sound. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Distinctly different people, distinctly different gifts from distinctly different places came together and there was one sound. And when that sound was heard, that entire, all of Jerusalem heard it, was confounded. And we know 3,000 people were filled with the Holy Ghost. There's something that happens when you yield and submit to what you are called to do in your place. And when each of us are doing our place in the altar, in the ministry, outside of the church, and then all of a sudden there's a beautiful sound. There's something that takes place. There's a sound that comes from heaven. Our entire focus should be about bringing people to a place where they are positioned to hear a sound from heaven and the fire to fall. The whole purpose of building faith is about positioning people to receive the sound and the fire. When you get people into that position and they receive Things begin to happen. Fill with the Holy Ghost. Somebody's healed. Somebody gets a word. Stuff begins to happen because there was a unity of faith. The scripture says in Psalms 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It goes on to say, it is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. Now watch this. I want you to hear this. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. It's in the place of unity. It's in the place of unity where he commands the blessing and life forevermore. Now, you guys are all very intelligent people. And I remember Brother Shelton said this, and it was very interesting how he said it. He said, the scripture tells you a lot by what it literally says, and it tells you a lot but what it doesn't necessarily say. (laughs) So if the blessing is in dwelling together in unity... And life is in dwelling together in unity. What is it in dwelling together in disunity? A curse. A curse and death. There is no blessing and there is no life in disunity. I'm going to tie all this together to altar working. So don't don't be like, oh, Brother Mike, you're starting. We'll we'll hit some other stuff, but we're going to deal with the altar and altar working. But you've got to catch this principle because the principle lays the groundwork of understanding how to operate in the altar with people. Understanding it's about people coming into the unity of the faith. Mm. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says this. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven or an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness that speaks lies. Now remember, he said there's six things the Lord hates, but seven are an abomination. Now watch what he says about the seventh here. And those who sow discord among the brethren. He hates six things. That, that means in the, in the Hebrew... They're his foe or his enemy. There's six things he can't stand. He, that's his enemy. But there's a seventh that disgusts him. Oh, I feel Jesus. There's a seventh that disgusts him. And that is those who sow discord among the brethren. 
that he doesn't just hate, he despises. It makes him one of it makes him one of vomit. He hates it with he loathes when you sow discord among the brethren. Why? Why? Because that was the prerequisite for the fire to fall. Because you are hindering a harvest when you participate in disunity. You are, per, you are hindering an outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the power of God to consume whatever's on the altar when there's not one mind in one accord. It was the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but they were sitting there and they said, Hey, come, let us build 11, uh, Genesis 11. Verses four, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves unless we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They said, let us make a name. Let us build a city. Let us become something. It was the same voice that was in the garden when that voice said, that serpent said, you can be like God. It was the same exact voice that was influencing the people in the Tower of Babel. They said, we want to be like God. Let us make a name. Let us become something. But watch what the scripture says. The Bible says that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of the men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. The people are one and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do now. Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Nothing. People that were not doing anything out of a spiritual context. They were operating out of flesh. They were being, they were being influenced by, obviously, demonic powers. They were trying to be like God. And God himself said, these people are one and they can accomplish anything. But I can't let them do that because this is not my will. So what did he do? He came down and he scattered them with many different languages. He scattered them across the whole earth. You see, the principle of oneness and unity is so powerful, the adversary understands it. It's so powerful and it works that the adversary does a very good job of working in unison. That's why Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. He says we are dealing with an operation that is unified. We're dealing with an operation that is structured and working. And because we're dealing with that, they're actually binding a lot of people. A lot of people are blind. A lot of people cannot see. A lot of people are very unified to the kingdom of darkness. People are unified to the kingdom of darkness. But God is telling us if you will operate in one accord as a body collectively and individually in your personal relationship with God, that is how you defeat the adversary. It was Jesus who said, a kingdom divided cannot stand. Let's go to that scripture real quick. The kingdom divided cannot stand. It's in Matthew, I believe it's chapter uh, 12. Matthew chapter 12, it says, every kingdom divided, verse 25, divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now watch this. How can one enter into a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me. He who is not gathering with me scatters abroad. 
You see the principle of unity again. He who is not gathering with me is scattering. A house divided can not stand. The adversary understands that in order to keep people bound, he's got to keep them in unity to the kingdom of darkness. But it's the people of God's authority, ability, right to set people free. Working in unity with the Spirit of God to break the blindness and to separate them, to divide Satan's kingdom, to plunder his house. That's why the Bible says in the book of Mark when it's talking about, it's talking about the strong man, it says that as long as that strong man is there in peace, his goods, they're untouched. Because the strong man sitting there in unity in the kingdom of darkness with nobody challenging it. The enemy understands that if I can keep the people of God in disunity, I can keep my house standing. If I can keep them individually not visiting their own altar and keep them individually not being in unity with the Spirit of God, then my house is standing. But if I can understand that that is how I come against the kingdom of darkness is in unity to God's spirit, unity with one another, and bringing the loss in unity with me. The kingdom of God is built on the rock. It is so important to understand this principle because faith comes down to understanding I'm trying to bring people to a place of unity with the Lord, unity with the Spirit, unity with the things that God wants to bring them into. we got to be able to identify the spirit of disunity. We see, the thing is, passive Christianity will always lead us to being unified to the adversary. Let me say that again. Passive Christianity will always lead us to being more united to the adversary. Why? How is that possible? Because passive Christianity is giving flesh control. And the scripture says in Romans 8 that the flesh is enmity. That means it's in direct opposition. It is an enemy against God. And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm trying to get, I'm, I'm telling you, we're going to get to the altar. You guys stay with me because I'm telling you, if you can get this principle, when you go to lay hands upon somebody, you can check yourself and say, am I in unity with the spirit? Am I in unity with my brother? Now I can get this man right here in unity with the Lord. Because when they were in one mind and one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Unsubmitted, un unsubjected flesh is an enemy against God, making it an ally to the adversary. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffereth violence, so we can't be passive. We've got to be aggressive. Aggressive with what? With people? No. Aggressive with our flesh. Aggressive with the adversary. Because the enemy cometh not but to. The only reason the enemy shows up is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. So the adversary is showing up for one reason. To divide you from your maker. To divide you from the Lord. When he showed up in the garden, he tempted them with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life for one reason only, to divide them from the presence of God, to divide them from having a walk with God, to divide them from hearing the voice of God. And when the adversary was done with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were fleeing and hiding in a bush, separated and divided from the voice. That is his goal. That is his job. And the way he does it is to us personally being the accuser of the brethren. The way he does it to it collectively is through offense, through bitterness, through trying to get us being very opinionated about each other and opinionated about the ministry and opinionated, opinionated about leadership and opi opinionated about all these other things. I'm just going to say something as strong as I feel it. I have never seen somebody who's extremely opinionated be very fruitful. Amen. 
Opinionated people are barren people. Because your opinion has to die at the altar if someone's going someone's to get to their altar. If you're going to take somebody to the altar, your opinion has to die at your altar to get them on their altar. Your, op your opinion is not worth losing the sound from heaven or the rushing mighty wind or the fire falling from heaven. Your opinion's not worth it. Your opinion is not worth aborting the harvest. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to talk to you why. I'm, you know, you want to know why God tells us to be submitted to one another? We talk a lot about submitted to leadership. We start talking about submitted to one another. It's like, uh, yeah, but I mean, I have a covering. Uh, the Bible says to be submitted to one another just as much as it talks about being submitted to your. We're supposed to be submitted to one another as well. You want to know why? You want to know why submission is such an important principle? I'll tell you why. Oh, it's a test to see if we, can, if, if, if we will be willing to, to, to hear the word no and submit. Of course, that's yes. But what's the overarching reason that we're supposed to be submitted to leadership? To preserve unity. God knows that every single one of us have opinions, we have desires, and we think things should go a certain way. He understands we're all human. And so he's got to put something in place for our frail human nature to be able to preserve the sound from heaven. And what he does is he puts submission in there to preserve the body. Why is forgiveness so important? Oh, because if you don't forgive others, they won't forgive you. Of course. But it's about unity. It's about staying in unity with one another. Because if I have a problem with you, I will not be in one mind and one accord with you. And if I allow there to stay being a fence, I'm compromising the sound from heaven. Forgiveness is about preserving unity. Submission's about preserving unity. Exactly. That's good. It's about preserving because that is where the blessing, that's where the blessing resides. That is where there's life. It doesn't matter if you have better ideas than other people. It doesn't matter if you're smarter than other people. It doesn't matter if you're gifted, more gifted. It doesn't matter if you're a greater prayer warrior than other people. It does not matter. God doesn't care. What God cares about is will you preserve and care more about the unity of the harvest more than your feelings, your gifts, or yourself. Because the problem is we are aborting the harvest when that becomes more of our priority of what we think, what we want, what we desire. That's why God says you've got to kill that iniquity because you've got to get that thing submitted to the Lord. And here's the thing. When you submit, even if you are right, it doesn't matter. God will still bless you because there's a blessing in submission. Why? God blesses everybody who, who gets in the line and who submits to his will because it's a principle to protect unity. And in that principle to protect unity, we have to submit to those principles. Forgiveness, submission, submitting to one another, loving one another, even when there's disagreement. Why do you think the Lord was so strong in his language? There's seven things that the Lord, that he calls an abomination, the seventh thing he calls an abomination. Those who sow discord among the brethren. Because he understands it will totally destroy the harvest. <clears throat> it's so important for us to understand the devil's a liar. And he wants to, first off, divide you from your relationship with God. Secondly, he wants to divide you in your relationship with each other, the body. And thirdly, he wants to divide you from being able to minister to the world. If he can start by dividing you from the Lord, he's already helped start dividing you from people and from the world. But we can be connected to the Lord, starting to walk with him. And we start having problems with people, but that begins to hinder our own flow with the Lord too. 
We've got to make sure all three of these things are in alignment and in unity so we can see the fire fall every service. When we're on the job, when we're at home, when we're with our family, you've got to check yourself and make sure where is my unity right now? Ephesians chapter 4 says this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I want to start getting into the importance of understanding your place as you begin to get into the altar. You begin to operate in the altar. Paul said, I'm going to read quite a bit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of of the calling when which you were called, how are you supposed to walk worthy of the calling? He tells you, with all loneliness, lowliness, gentleness, long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The way that you walk worthy of the calling, the way that you walk worthy of the calling and you carry yourself to deal with the lost, is you have these principles working in you. He said, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another in love. But watch what he says, endeavoring. That word endeavoring in the Greek literally means to... Use speed to make an effort to be prompt or to be earnest and diligent to labor. <laughs> You're supposed to fight for unity. You're supposed to fight to get back right with your brother and sister. You're supposed to fight to get back into that place where there's a connection. And watch what he says here. It's so amazing. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The word bond in the Greek means ligament, a band or bond. It's a joint tie. It's talking about a ligament. It's, only, it's, it's really using your word picture here of our own bodies and the ligaments that keep much of our body together. Those ligaments are held to, holding it together. And what is that ligament? Peace. Peace is what keeps the body together. Peace is what keeps you and your brother connected. Why do you think the Bible says, follow peace and holiness, with which out no man shall see the Lord? Because when you are chasing after, do me and my brother here, do, they, do we have a lack of peace? Do we have an issue here? That means that ligament is, is severed. That means that there's no connection. That means we're not operating together in unity. That means we're not in one accord. That means that there's not going to be a fire falling from heaven between the two of us and whatever ministry we're involved with. If there's a severing of peace, that ligament's broken, which ties us together. I got to check my peace with my brothers and sisters. Am I offended? I know that this has come up a few times, but I just I feel to hit it again. Am I offended? Am I jealous? Am I, am I having some type of issue with my brother or my sister that I'm working in ministry with or my leaders or those that I'm leading? Because that ligament should be connecting me to my leaders, connecting me to my brothers and sisters, my peers, and connecting me to those that are underneath me. God was so serious about protecting the bond of peace, the ligament of peace. I'm, I'm almost done with this aspect here, but I just, I got to say this. You guys realize that Miriam, Moses' sister, didn't like the way Moses was doing things. His sister. And she's like, we're family. I can say what I want. <laughs> I'm, I mean, we're family. I mean, I grew, I, I grew up around the dude. I mean, well, kind of far away because he grew up in Egypt. But, you know, we're blood. We're blood. I don't like the way his wife's acting. I'm going to say something. It was not Moses that vindicated himself. It was not Moses that said to Miriam, you better repent because you just wronged me. Right. It was God who said, you better watch yourself. Moses actually fell on his face to preserve unity. Moses fell on his face and repented for her, prayed, interceded for her. And she was struck with leprosy. 
Because God does not play with destroying the unity of the faith. Oh, but we're family. We're, you know, we're brother, sister. I can say what I want. I know you're the leader, but it doesn't matter. It's a principle, and you've got to protect the unity, and God will do whatever he's got to do to protect it. And he showed that with Korah. Three leaders rose up in the book of Numbers against Moses, and they said, hey, Moses, three elders, main elders rose up. And they said, hey, Moses, you know, I'm kind of sick of you calling the shots. I think we should say some things. I think we should have some say. Moses, again, did not strike them, did not vindicate himself. He wanted to preserve the unity. He fell on his face, interceded for them. But Korah and them were running their mouth and saying this and that because they didn't care about the unity. They cared about themselves. The scripture says that the earth swallowed them and their families and those that followed them were were judged. I'm not trying to be heavy on you. I'm just trying to help you because I can't get away from this principle of understanding this. This is, this, is, this is serious when it comes to unity of the faith and operating in the spirit and understanding. I've got to do everything I can to protect the unity of my brothers and sisters, of myself and God, and the lost that come to these altars. Those men were swallowed up by the earth, by the earth, which is an Old Testament figurative of the flesh, the earth, dirt. They were swallowed by the earth because they decided to rise against the unity of what God was doing. It's something that we've got to preserve with everything we've got to protect personally, collectively, and to the lost coming in. Protect the unity so that we can hear a sound from heaven. Let's keep reading in Ephesians. This is amazing. Scripture says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the ligament of peace that, that, that connects us together, it's peace. Now watch what he says. There's one body, one body, one spirit. You are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now watch what this says. Please hear me. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Do you see how he just, what he did right there is he's talking about collectively one faith, one baptism, one calling, one, 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 one. And then he says, but each of us have been given distinctly gifts. What he's doing is he is showing you the same principle of one mind and one accord. And what he's showing you here is that collectively we are one. Christ is one. The principle all over the scriptures is one, one, one. A husband and wife become one flesh. It's about unity. You become one. One is the ultimate number in scripture. It represents his power. It represents his glory. It represents that there's none other but him. One is such a critical thing for you to understand. And he's saying we are all a part of this one body, but each of us have been given distinct gifts. Just like that Greek word, one accord, distinctly different notes that play one sound. It's the same principle. Let's skip down to verse 11. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity. Hear it again. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Talks about no longer being children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, saying you're no longer walking in immaturity. You skip down to verse 15. He says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things in him, who, who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself 
in love. We are all joined and knit together. We all have a purpose. We all have a place. We are all one member. Each of us are members of one body, and we all are distinct and different, and that together makes up the body of Christ operating in kingdom authority, kingdom dominion, helping people get saved because we each are submitting to our place in his altar out there outside of the church or here in the church. It's amazing because I was reading this just a little bit. It says that uh, the majority of ligaments, let me find it right here. There are more than 900 ligaments throughout your body. Most are located in your arms and your legs. A body can be alive with damaged ligaments, but it's not going anywhere. The arms and the legs is where the majority of the ligaments are. If we are going to have movement in the altar, movement with the lost, movement with people coming into the kingdom, we've got to make sure that our ligaments are strong, our peace is strong, the unity of the faith is there. And by making sure that that is there between our elders and our leaders, between our peers and those we're leading, the body, the arms and the legs, the movement, the doing of the body, the direction of the body, the, the places the body can go are great unprecedented places. Most of the ligaments are in the arms and the legs. Where there's no peace between each other, between us and God, between us working with the lost, there's no movement. So important for us to understand this. Now watch what this says. I want to go back to Ephesians and I'm going to begin to I'm going to begin to transition here into talking about the operation of faith in the altars. Listen to what this says in Romans chapter 12, because I think sometimes I want to help somebody here. I want to help somebody. Some of you think because you're not an you're not you're not an apostle, you're not a prophet, you're not a teacher, you're not a pastor, you're not an evangelist. What can I do in the altar? What can I do for those people that are coming in here? You can do a lot. You can do a lot. And I'll give you scripture. Look at this. Romans chapter 12. It's amazing. Verses 3 through 8. Be honest. Verse 3. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. This is the New Living Translation of Romans 12, 3. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Not measuring yourself by your brother. Not measuring yourself by your sister. That's why Paul said that they that they uh, measure themselves amongst themselves or they judge themselves amongst themselves, they're not wise because you're, ju you're using the wrong system. You're using the wrong measurements to measure yourself when you do it with people. You've got to measure according to the faith that God has given you. Watch what it says. Just as our bodies have many parts, going back to unity again, our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function. It is the same with Christ's body. We are parts of one body. We all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts. There we go again. Different gifts, distinct gifts, different ways, different uh, uses that God does through us. And there are... Different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, did you know that was a gift to serve others? Serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If your gift is to give generously, did you know that was a gift? If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Wow. Oh, well, you know, the only two ways you can be using an altar is you got to pray somebody to the Holy Ghost, you got to read their mail. That's not in the Bible. Discerning spirits is in the Bible. Praying through the Holy Ghost is in the Bible, but that's not the only two things in the Bible. <laughs> Did you know that you may have a gift to walk up to somebody 
while they're bawling their eyes out and for you to literally grab their shoulders and say, you can do this. God believes you, believes in you, and he hears you. I feel the Holy Ghost. Do you know you could walk up to somebody and say, you know what? Can I take you to lunch today? I just, I feel compelled. Because you have a spirit of generosity on you. First Corinthians 12 talks about working of miracles, gifts of healing, gifts of helps administration, various tongues. I think that part of our struggle in the altar, pastor gets up and says, we got 10 guests up here, and we're sitting there like bumps on a log because we're too busy comparing ourselves amongst ourselves rather than to the faith that he's put in us. And that begins to sever your unity between you and the spirit. Because that faith that God has put in you, that faith is what you're supposed to be unified to. What God's called you to in the altar. What God's called you to in the workplace. What God's called you to. It's okay if you're not necessarily the most gifted praying people through the Holy Ghost. That's okay. We can teach you. We can give you the the practical ways of doing that, and we're going to before this is said and done. And I believe that more people here are going to be able to pray people through the Holy Ghost, no doubt. But what if your gift of kindness, what if your gift of generosity, what if your gift of helps is what bridges the gap for somebody to receive the Holy Ghost? What if you have a ministry of healing, and I'm not talking about physical bodies, some of you, I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. Some of you have gone through so much trauma in your life that you don't even realize that God is trying to use that now as a ministry. But because you think it's not a ministry, you think that that's something to be ashamed of still, even though God's tried to heal you, wants to keep healing you. And the way the completion of healing is going to happen is when you start ministering in that trauma. When you start ministering in that trauma, that's when you're going to begin to see full healing in yourself. Because freely you, freely you receive the start of the healing, freely you need to give the completion of the healing. Can we lift our hands real quick? I just feel the Holy Ghost. God is going to begin to right now help you get more unified with the faith that is in you. I'm not done, but you need to hear me right now. God right now wants to get you into more alignment with the unity of the faith that he's put in you personally. I'm telling you that you'd begin to not struggle as much with offense or bitterness or unforgiveness if you would submit to the gift that's inside of you. You might not be an apostle. You might not be a prophet. You might not be an evangelist, but that's okay. You have a place in the body and God is trying to connect you through peace to the lost that are coming in and to the souls that he wants to save. Come on, in the name of Jesus, let's just pray for a moment. Come on, that's it. I want you to begin to repent about some dis unity in your life. Begin to repent about some disunity between you and God. Begin to repent about some disunity between you and your brother or sister. Begin to repent about some disunity of not understanding the gifts that God has put inside of you. God, I pray the spirit of revelation, the spirit of understanding would be loosed upon the people right now in the name of Jesus that they'd begin to recognize their gift. They begin to recognize their place and walk in that in the name of Jesus Christ. My God, my God, my God, my God. You are powerful if you're an encourager. You are powerful if you have the gift of kindness. You are powerful if you have the gift of helps. You are powerful if you're an administrator. You are powerful if you're a teacher. Whatever your gift is, the body needs it, and you've got to walk in it in this altar. 
My God. You got to cut, destroy. The adversary's trying to make a house divided. He's trying to make your temple divided. But we will not do that. We are going to let it stand. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oneness. Oneness. We believe in the oneness of God. The oneness of God. And we need the oneness of each other. It's the same principle. One. One. Hero Israel. The Lord our God is one. We are one body. We are called out from the world because we are one body collectively. Jesus' name. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I've heard pastor talk about it, bishop talk about it. That word double-minded means two-spirited. That means you're not in one mind and one accord with the Lord. You're two-spirited. You're not oneness with the Lord. A double-minded man is not going to operate effectively in the altar. If you are too busy comparing your gift to the gifts next to you, rather than the faith that's been put in you. I'll just say this. Brother Alan McGuckian, he, he, that man is an encourager. He's got a lot of gifts. But I'm going to tell you one thing. That man's an encourager. And God uses him, God uses him a lot also with discerning his spirits. He's so encouraging. There's another man, and when Alan steps into that and walks in that, man, people feel the love. They feel just like, man, I can do this. There's another man I know. He's actually on the Eastern Shore. Whew. Talk about encourager. He'll call me, and I, we'll talk for five minutes. He's, a, he's a, a pastor. He's not the head pastor. He's the, uh, I think he's the assistant associate pastor. Has been for 40 years. Because he knows his place. And he's the associate pastor and he knows I'm not called to lead this thing. I'm called to just encourage and I'm called to lift. He told me, he said, God spoke to him when he was like, I don't know, his 30s and said, your job is to lift up the hands of the man of God. And he's done it for 40 years. That man has seen so many souls saved, it's crazy. That man has changed so many lives, it is he is so powerful. When he opens up his mouth, he's now in his 70s, he opens up his mouth, I can feel my spirit just begin to get stronger. Literally. He'll just say, Brother McGurk, I believe in you. God is going to do this. God's gonna... He's, not, he's not even, ne- I mean, he's sort of prophesying, but he's more encouraging. But I'm telling you, I'll hang up that phone and I'll literally feel 10 times stronger than before I picked it up. Because he knows his gift. How many people could you pick up the phone and just simply say a word of encouragement to that would change their life? Ministry doesn't always look like praying people through the Holy Ghost. I, God uses me in praying people through the Holy Ghost. So it's not like I'm just saying that. I mean, I, I, I've seen God, I've seen a lot of people get filled with the Holy Ghost, but I know for a fact that's not what this is all. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's the end goal and then continuing in that. But I understand that There's a lot of things that have to come before that and after that (laughs) and after. Just just yesterday, I had a chance to go pray with a man who's had cancer. He's a neurosurgeon. It's been an amazing journey, just the way God's connected me to this family. I went over to his house, got a chance to pray with him, and just I was like talking to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to do? I said, I'm kind of nervous. I'm around all these people that are a lot smarter than me older than me, God was just like, just be there. Just be there. Just, that's it, just be there. I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) that's not that hard. (laughs) Praise God, this mission's not too bad. (laughs) And then as I was leaving, the Lord just started to just put into my heart, "Go, go get flowers, write a card, and put it at such and such's house. There's some, a family that I had worked with for a while where they lost a young man to a motorcycle accident. He was only 28, died when he was 31, was in a coma for basically two and a half years. 
I started doing a Bible study with him, just got connected to the family, and it was really tough to see them go through all this, but I just have always, I want to keep the connection. I want to keep ministering to them. And you know what my job was yesterday for them? On the day of the death of their son, pick up flowers, write a nice card, put it at their house. That was ministry. God was using me in encouragement and kindness in that moment. I didn't go lay hands upon them and, come on, you can get through this. No. Ministry sometimes looks extremely, and sometimes it looks very normal. And you can't put expectation the way it's supposed to look. You've got to just walk in what God is leading you to do. And when you get into unity with the Spirit, it'll lead you to just do small things like that. Pick up the phone and call such and such. In our Oikos ministries, what would happen? We've already seen so many things happen. But what would happen if we took and went a step farther beyond struggling with this, but I want to be this, I want to be that, I want to be used like, and we just stepped into the faith that God's given us. What would happen to those people you're leading? I'm going to tell you what would happen. When you get in one mind and one accord, suddenly there comes a sound from heaven as of a rushy, mighty wind, and the fire falls, and people are changed. When we come up to the altar and we pray for people, first thing we should do is, if there's people that are up here that need to be prayed for, please come up. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I've seen pastor up there just like, anybody, please. I'm, just, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just being real. That shouldn't be in an apostolic church. We, that shouldn't be. We, we should be some of the first people up here, even if we don't need to respond for ourselves. Because you realize when somebody sees someone else go, they're like, okay, I'll go. Sometimes we just need to go to the altar just because we need to go to the altar to get somebody else to the altar. There is something about taking a step of faith and coming up here. This is not just ritual. There is an act of faith that is happening when people come to this altar. And so we need to make it a priority. And I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I leave Sunday mornings exhausted. And I'm like, why am I so tired? And you know what the Lord told me? He told me because there's there's still a lot of saints sucking virtue. I'm like, ooh, what? He said, yeah, still a lot of saints come in to do this on Sunday morning rather than coming to do this. Peace, bond of peace, ligament of peace. Can I encourage you? Can I love you? Can I? And listen, if we would focus and get more aggressive with our altar at home, we wouldn't have to run always to the altar at the church. Because it's the saints, the fivefold ministry, the saints, the leaders, the elders, the deacons. It's your job to have an altar before you come to church. Your altar is not, and now there's times, obviously, where you've got to come to church. But you, do you ever notice how there's quite a few leaders that they're not in the altar every Sunday? That's not because they're backslidden. It's because they've tried to visit the altar before they got here. But it's not just for the leaders to do that, the saints. Because this is the thing, the way that you begin to rise, and I'm not talking about being a preacher behind the pulpit. I'm talking about rising in authority. I'm talking about rising in responsibility in the kingdom. The way that you begin to rise in those things is that you have an everyday altar. You learn the voice of God. You step out in it, and God trusts you and says, I trust you with little. I'm going to give you more. And because I'm going to give you more, now I'm going to let you see some more. And so if you can be trusted with little, he can give you much. So it starts with when they come to the altar, I'm not coming to receive every Sunday morning. I'm coming to give. And if I've got anything that's disunifying me with my brother or my sister or with God, I'm trying to deal with it before the first note is played. Because I want to hear a sound from heaven today. I want to hear a sound from heaven tomorrow. I want to hear a sound from heaven on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. I want to hear a sound from heaven. Your ability to hear the voice of God is directly connected to your unity with the Spirit. It is. I believe 
therefore I speak. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the rhema, the word of God. You see, this is the operation of faith. This is what we've got to pay attention to. We've got to pay attention when we're dealing with people. What is God wanting to do? You might not know. You know one of the best things to do when you don't know what the Lord is saying? Do something biblical. <laughs> Give them a hug. <laughs> Tell them you're happy to see them. Tell them God loves them. Tell them you're glad they're in the house of God. When you don't have a word, at least do something biblical. Showing the love of God. And the more that you do that, the more you become sensitive to the voice of God where stuff just starts flowing out because there's unity of spirit. You got in unity with his word, which then gets you in unity with his spirit. I was, uh, this is where I'm going to begin to slow down and, as you could say, land the plane. I was in Canada recently ministering. And there was a young man who uh, was there. We had, we had quite a few get the Holy Ghost. It was a great time. God was doing, doing some stuff. But there was this guy who was standing like here. I was talking to his wife, and she had a, a guest, and we prayed for them. But then I looked at the guy, and I said, she said, he doesn't have the Holy Ghost. I said, why not? He said, I don't know, man. He said, I've been seeking for 36 years. 36 years I've been wanting to get the Holy Ghost. Well, now my radar is going off big time. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? That, the Bible says, if you've been baptized in his name, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there's something blocking. There's some type of disunity right here. Something is blocking his unity between him and God. So I'm going, okay, well, what's going on? He's like, well, I backslid for a little while and this and that. And I just, I said, let me ask you a question. Can you receive the, do you want the Holy Ghost? He goes, I said, no, no. Do you want the Holy Ghost? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, well, here's our first problem. You don't believe you can receive the Holy Ghost. So I can't pray for you if you don't have faith. The Bible says you've got to mix your faith with the word of God. You've got to come into unity. Your faith has to come into unity with the word. Brother Bar, nice jacket. <laughs> We've got the same one on, sorry. That was my orange just went. Anyway. The <laughs> um, that was my orange. Um, said, you need to have faith that you can receive the Holy Ghost. He's like, well, you know, I'm like, okay, you have a lot of shame, obviously. It wasn't, I didn't need a lot of spiritual discernment to realize this guy didn't believe that he could receive the Holy Ghost because of his past. He didn't feel worthy. So did I just say, lift your hands and you're going to receive the Holy Ghost while he's got all this junk disunifying him from the spirit, keeping him divided from God, all the shame, unforgiveness and all this stuff? No, I ministered to him about his need. I ministered to him about where he was. Because here's the thing, to operate in faith, you got to get that person you're working with into one mind and one accord with you and God so the fire can fall. And so if I'm talking to somebody and they're way over here in their doubt and I'm way over here in faith, you've got a gap. You got a gap where they're not going to get anything from God because you're, you're trying to pull them along a road and they're not even attached to the cart. I had to bring him from here to here so that together we could get to here. This isn't just about the Holy Ghost. This is about healing too. This is about encouraging people. This is about a word of knowledge. This is about bringing people to a place where they can receive the word. When pastor's preaching, you know that's what he's doing? Sorry, I'm giving away, all, I'm giving away the preacher's secrets. The whole purpose of preaching is to get the body to come into unity with the word of faith and you responding to that word so something can happen in you, through you, in the spirit world, whatever. That is what preaching's all about. It's bringing you to a decision, a place where you come into the unity of the word. Now, not everybody does it, of course, because, well, we're all human and we're like, 
Some days we're like, oh, I don't feel like listening. Other days we got hard hearts, whatever. But that is the whole goal in preaching and in ministry is to begin to discern the need, deal with the need, and bring them to the place where they can receive the solution. It's that simple. That's ministry. Identifying the need and giving them the solution for that moment. Sometimes we try to pray everybody through the Holy Ghost when they are so broken, they literally can't even stand up straight. God told me one time, he told me one time, he said, do you know how many people would receive the Holy Ghost if you gave them love first? I was like, wow. He said, you know how many people would receive the Holy Ghost if you, if you began to help them get healed first? Because the healing starts to break down the walls and the barriers that keep them from wanting the Holy Ghost. Yep. Yep. So by breaking down barriers and walls, you're now positioning them more to be unified with the Spirit and be one mind and one accord with what the Holy Ghost wants to do. In our, when I say our, I'm not referring to just, I'm not referring to just any, I'm referring to Pentecostal culture, whatever. In our mindset sometimes, we get so worried about what we want to happen. We get so worried about what we hope happens. We get so worried about what, what if it doesn't happen that we don't really deal with what needs to happen. And what needs to happen is whatever the will of God is for that person in that moment, whatever their need is. That is the most important thing. What is the will of God for them? It could be a, we talked about already, you're awesome. I love you. You're going to make it. You look great today. God's hands on your life. That one word could take them a step closer to then get into the waters of baptism. But maybe they couldn't get to the waters of baptism until they first had that encouragement. So I was dealing with this guy, and I'm going to start to land the plane here. Dealing with this guy, and I began to pray with him. And I said, okay, let me talk to you for a second. I said, you don't feel worthy. And he literally, when he, I think he was praying for the Holy Ghost before I saw him. He was kind of like, you know, he just, he had no faith. He had damaged faith. Why? Because he was so ashamed of his past. He's like, like this, 36 years he wanted the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, okay, let's, let's talk about this. You're ashamed because of why? He's like, oh, this and that. I said, look, do you not? I said, the blood works, bro. The blood works, and you, we're not going to pray until you start having faith in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. That blood is for you. That righteousness, you are innocent the moment you repent. You've got to believe that, and I'm not praying for you until you believe that. But if you begin to believe that, we're going to pray against the shame, and we're going to pray that God will. And you could just, as I'm saying these things to him, you could just start to see physically something beginning to happen. That was the gift of faith. That was faith beginning to operate where stuff, be he started to have faith in the fact that I don't have to be captive or identified by my past. I don't have to be identified as a backslider. I can be new. And he started to believe the word, but you see, I didn't jump into just praying him through the Holy Ghost. I dealt with the issue that was hindering him from receiving the Holy Ghost. And I said, God can fill you, but you've got to have faith faith that he's already forgiven you that the blood works and I'm telling him this and he's starting to believe it and I said okay now I want you to lift your hands and he lifted his hands and he started to just begin to say hallelujah and we're dealing with the shame we're talking about the shame I said it was before we prayed I said we're going to repent again but we're going to repent for forgiving yourself that's what we're going to do. We're going to forgive ourselves. He said, okay. I said, I want you to honestly and earnestly say, God, forgive me. I'm letting this go. I'm not holding on to this condemnation anymore. He started to say it. Things began to break. I said, okay, now lift your hands. He began, I feel the Holy Ghost. He began to lift his hands. And I said, God's about to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Just yield your tongue and God's going to fill you. And do not be... Uh, don't worry about what it sounds like. Don't worry about what it feels like. Just yield to it. Give God your tongue. It's your voice. It's your mouth. But it's the spirit that is giving the utterance. And when it comes, just release it. Let it go. And he began to lift his hands. And all of a sudden, it slowly began to come. And I'm telling you, this man just began to break. And when he began to break, and he began to speak with tongues, he had tears flowing down his face. Now watch what happened. It was amazing. It was one of the coolest experiences. He started speaking in tongues. And right then, the whole Holy Ghost said, 
command his heart to be healed. And I'm like, oh, in the name of Jesus. So while he's receiving the Holy Ghost, I said, I command you to, I command your heart to be healed and you to be made whole right now. And I'm talking about he began to drop. And I'm going to tell you what happened. There was an angel of restoration that swept. This was way after the altar call. Hardly anyone else was in the building. But as he's on the ground and my hand is upon him, I literally felt an angel come into the room of restoration where this man literally was restored right there in the altar. But it wasn't just by, come on, you can get the Holy Ghost. Come on, God. Let, no, it was, what's going on right here? Why do you feel this way about yourself? And we didn't just stop. Oh, he spoke in tongues. Praise God. No, we said, where's the restoration? Where's the healing? You can be made new. You can be made whole. God makes all things new. And he was made new. Literally, when he got up and his face was soaked with tears, he had a smile from end to end. He said, I, I really didn't believe that I could ever have it. But God did it. I said, bro, God is going to use you. You have been so battled because of how anointed. There is such a, I'm talking about his wife and him. They're going to be, I, believe they're, I believe they're called to go do something. They're called to do something. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And that angel, you see, in the altar, if we stop walking by preconceived ideas, preconceived notions of, well, this is what I think should happen. You've just grieved the spirit. You've just shut out the Holy Ghost. You have just, because the thing is, we're not operating by our intellect or our carnal mind. We're operating by the spirit. I believe, therefore I speak. And if the only thing I got to speak is, about righteousness to this person and dealing with their condemnation, I speak that, and God has just accomplished something great. Take the barriers off. Stop comparing yourself to Brother Mott, Brother Middleton, Pastor Wright, all these people that are operating. Stop thinking, I got to go around and give everybody a word. No, you just got to do what God tells you to do because when you do it in unity with the body, there is such a beautiful sound that begins to fall and come from heaven. It's a rushing mighty wind and the fire falls and people are forever changed. It's the last story I'm going to tell you and I'm closing here. We were just at Maryland, D.C. Youth Convention. There was a young man that came to the altar literally with his hood on. Literally. He was praying at the altar like this. You couldn't even see his face. And I stopped and I went, okay, that's, that, that ain't going to work. <laughs> He's sitting there praying like this. And this young lady, you know, she was full of faith. She's got her hand on me. Going at it. And, I, and I was like, okay. I got in unity with this young lady. I got into unity with this young lady. I said, hey, tell him to take his hood off. And when he takes his hood off, something's going to happen. I lie not. She just whispered to him. We got in unity working together in the spirit. She said, hey, take your hood off. When that young man took his hood off, you felt, we could literally, you literally felt chains break. Because I think it was Jalen that was up there. He said, if anybody's got depression, I want you to come up here. That man was wearing his depression in the altar. That hood was a physical representation of the cloud that was over his mind of what he was living under. That darkness physically was manifesting itself right there in the altar while he was like this. I said, well, no, if you're going to be free, that, that depression's got to go. We got to get rid of this hood that is a representation of that darkness. And the moment she said to him, take your hood off. He took it off in something. You could feel the atmosphere in that little spot just shift. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost came into that spot, and he just started to, you could tell, like, tears just started kind of coming down. And I told her, I said, tell him to lift his head. He lifted his head, and I'm telling you, I, said, I, I got involved a little bit more, got involved, and I said, come on, we're going to pray him through the Holy Ghost. I said, lift up your mouth, lift up your voice, lift up your head, and begin to say hallelujah, and God's going to fill with the Holy Ghost. There was a complete shift of demeanor where he came up there like this, and then as soon as we were done, within five minutes, he had his hands raised, he had his head raised, and he was speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, because when you operate in unity together, Stuff happens, and it can be that simple. Can we all stand? In Jesus' name.
God, help us if there's any disunity in our hearts towards you. If we are not in one accord and one mind with our brothers or sisters, with our elders, our leadership, anybody and anyone, God, that would try to, would try to hinder us from the harvest and the, and the sound, God, I pray that we deal with it and that we would be content with our place in your kingdom because, God, the most powerful place we can be in is your will. Let's just, let's just declare that right now and let's receive that by faith. God, I want to be in your will. The most powerful place I can be, God, in this hour is in your perfect will. God, if you want me to be an encourager, that's what I'll be. If you want me to operate in administration, that's what I'll do. God, if you want to send me as an apostle, that's what I'll do. God, if you want me to be an encourager, if you want me to be one with kindness or generosity, that's what I'll do. If you want me to be a helper, God, that's what I'll do. God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to operate it in it, in the altar, outside the altar, outside the building, in my job, in my family. I am going to try to do my best to be sensitive to your voice. And God, if my mind has been off of you, I want to put my mind back upon you so that I can get your attention, God. Right now, Lord, I pray by the authority of your word and by the power that's in your name that you would loose a fresh revelation of one mind in one accord so that we can receive a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind in the name of Jesus Christ let it be so in Jesus name in Jesus name